So I've done a few posts recently about rebuilding a cusp with composite and it's definitely been the topic I've had the most questions about. And so I promised a few of you I would make a video on how to do this. So here it is. So let's get straight into it. If we have a look at a case like this. Okay, so here we've got your classic scenario of sort of medium sized amalgam and we've lost that corner cusp. And when you look down at it closely, sure, you could fill this with a indirect restoration, like an onlay. But equally, this would work well with composite. And so when we clean it all up, this is our problem. Now, the question is, why is this difficult? If you think about it like a class one being the most simple restoration, it's because we've got loads of surrounding structures to copy and guide us as to where we're supposed to go. And then next up from that is a class two. However, with class twos, we've got all kinds of kits and matrix bands that are designed to help us recreate that anatomy. And basically temporarily give us something to guide us with. However, when we've lost a wall like this, it's much more down to freestyling really. And sure, we do have matrix band options here where we can wrap around, but it's not always the way we have to go. And actually the difficulties are not just related to where we put our lines and grooves, but also the height of the cusp and where do we actually put it. And then to add to that, because we're using composite, sometimes you place an increment and you start, you start adapting it from one side and then the bit you've just done moves and you find that you're going in this constant circle where every time you get one bit right, you're ruining the last bit you just did. So the key here is to, with each increment, only try and achieve basically one goal at a time. And so the first aim here is to simply rebuild the cusp tip. Okay, so that sounds simple enough, but the thought then is, where is the cusp tip? And now, if we draw a couple little lines on this tooth, what we can see is we've got our cusp tips sort of here that line up. And so if we draw another parallel line across the other side of the tooth, it might look something like that. And then equally, if we look at the other two cusp tips that are already present and draw a line like this, and then something similar parallel to that going through the other remaining cusp tip, it might look something like this. So what we can see now is that where those lines cross, the actual tip of the cusp is going to be about here. Okay. And so all we really want to take from that is that the cusp tip is not at the edge of the tooth. And if you just put a circumferential band on here, what normally happens is you build up the wall and that almost becomes your highest point. And that results in the cusp tip being right over here. And that's just simply not where it needs to be. And so the first point is visualizing what we're trying to put back. And then the second is how do we actually go about doing it? So this was a tip I picked up from uh, the OG Lincoln Harris years ago when he posted it on, on Ripe. And what he basically said was, you want to just create like a Mr. Whippy cone and uh, a, the aim being just to create the cusp tip. So that's exactly what we've got here. I've created this peak, and now the aim of the game is just to adjust that slightly so that we get the correct height, but also get the correct cusp tip position aligned with those lines that I just drew. So we're aiming for about a third in from the edge of the cavity and matching the height. So a really useful little clinical tip for this is we spend so long looking in our mirror at the occlusal surface of the tooth and assessing it from there. And that is great and useful to do for this, this exercise. But we also want to be looking down the mesial of the tooth. So I'll quite often lean back and be looking down across the mesial surfaces of the tooth. And it's going to help me gauge both the height of the cusp and also uh, the position of it in that buccal palatal position. So once, all I'm going to do is either take a micro brush or a condensing instrument and start to gently shape this. And I'll end up with something that looks a bit like this. And that's all I'm trying to do 
it's so tempting to cheat or to try and push the push yourself and do more. Oh, just create that buckle wall, or oh, I'll just add a little bit of fissure anatomy or, or a bit of the occlusal surface. Fight every temptation to do that, because much like if you were doing a class two, you wouldn't just start putting all the occlusal anatomy in before you've done the wall. It's the same here. The first thing we want to do is build that cusp tip height and position, and then work from there. So then for me, the next thing I'm going to do is start to effectively use this cusp tip that I've built as a bit of a wall to work against. So I'm going to add in some composite here, and I'm going to add in some composite here. Now you could do that if there was an adjacent tooth, you could do that with a matrix band uh, on that medial proximal surface. Um, but then this is what I'm aiming for. So now all I've done is turn the restoration turn into a back, turn the cavity back into a class one, which is pretty much my whole aim with a composite is to simplify, 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 and get it to a more easy, restorable situation. So now it's just a case of following the cuspal inclines. Hopefully the height of the cusp that I've put in is gonna match and copy what was already there. And so I can use some composite there to match the anatomy, copying where the embrasures are and the fissures are to, to guide me um, into some, some, some simple shaping. And then adding a little bit of tint there um, just to try and help it blend in a bit. And then crucially, when, this, is, this is what I said, looking at it from the side, we can appreciate there that the heights are pretty much, pretty much there or thereabouts. Now these will very often take a little bit of adjustment in the mouth, but if it's such that we are making slight subtle changes to maybe a cusp angle or even a cusp tip height, rather than having to reshape the entire occlusal surface, that's gonna work out a lot better for us. And then it's cross your fingers, check with the, with the uh, occlusion, and you know, got away with it on this one. And um, fortunately this just, I gave it a little bit of a polish, but that was about it. So, what if we actually had the proximal wall present? So sometimes we have these sort of niche scenarios where this patient came in with a failing composite restoration. We could see it's leaking at the margins and it's got this sort of strange gray color underneath. So I was already a bit anxious or a bit hesitant as to exactly what we're gonna find. So the first step is to take it out. So remove the restoration. For every now and again, I seem to find these where there's that little bit of, someone's left a bit of amalgam underneath and some sort of liner. I can only assume they were getting deep and uh, were getting anxious about removing the last bit of filling. What I like to keep in my mind is if it's filling I'm removing, obviously when we're getting deeper, we, we need to be cautious and conscious that there is a pulp there. But I'm never going to leave a bit of amalgam in the base like that because it's, it's unbonded to the tooth there's likely bacteria underneath that and what I'm doing is sealing that in. But also, as long as I'm careful, if I'm drilling amalgam, I'm not going to expose the pulp um, just by removing that, as long as we, like I said, only remove the amalgam. So anyway, then the next step is to clean this up. Sometimes uh, when I'm chatting about this to uh, delegates on our course or um, when I'm discussing this recently with my mentees, when you're clearing out a cavity, some parts of the procedure require more detailed focus than others. And so when I'm removing the initial amalgam, I can be fairly efficient about working my way around the edges and getting that out quite quickly. But when I get to this situation, I'm going to start to take things a lot, a lot more carefully and slowly. And what that might mean is slowing my drill speed down or uh, going to a finer grip burr. But particularly on that distal corner, uh, I'm going to want to see if I can maintain that distal wall, but only if it's got sufficient thickness. So here I've cleaned out that carries, really focusing on a clean ADJ. I've left some stain dentine over the pulp area, but it's rock hard to probe. And you can see that that distal wall is probably just about thick enough to be kept. And that's really gonna make my life a lot easier here for exactly the reasons I talked about in the last case. So again, I could take a matrix band here and sort of tack it in place and wrap it around the corner of the tooth. Or alternatively, I could place my first increment and try and just rebuild that wall as best I can. 
So that's what I chose to do in this case. And again, focusing a little bit on what I spoke about in the last case in that I'm not trying to build the cusp tip to full height in this, in this increment. I'm just building a bit of a wall that blends continuously from the lingual round to the distal. And then I can start to shape the, uh, the cusp tip on the next increment. The way I like to do this is I will inject my compule of composite to create a sort of little bridge between the two margins. And then it's a case of condensing it so that the composite starts to push upwards and create a, a bridge that, that links between the, the, the margins all the way up to the occlusal surface. The difficulty of as you manipulate one part, the last bit you just did seems to get adjusted and moved. Always an issue here. But really, what I want to be doing is getting the composite round to just touching here and just touching about here, isn't it? And then I'm going to take my brush and just start to, starting apically usually, just start brushing across like this. And here, again, I can just about get a paintbrush in there just to blend that up against the enamel wall. Once you've got the composite starting to stick a little bit, not cured, but just sticking against those enamel margins, you can be a little bit less cautious with shaping this part here. And I'm going to take my condenser instrument or a micro brush and just start to pack into that area lightly and create the height that I want. You can always go in on the outside and repolish or reshape that later. Uh, so I'll get it as close as I can on the external surface. Um, but sometimes you have to accept that some areas will be better than others. And then I will get that cured. And then the next step is going to be to add in the occlusal anatomy. But you can see here that, like I said, the cusp tip is about here. So it's just inside of where the wall was that I built. But again, I'm using the anatomy of the tooth that it's given me to just copy and carry on from the embrasures into my fissure pattern. And then here distally, it's, it's a combination of being guided by what the tooth is giving you as well as having a sort of general understanding of the cusp anatomy that's needed. So I hope that was useful and answered some of the questions that you guys had on rebuilding a cusp tip in direct composite. Try out some of those methods and just remember, just, just to keep in mind, you want to keep it as simple as possible and don't try and overdo it with each increment that you're adding in.